Hi there. Welcome to Bourbon Turntable. We are the show that blends the love of music with the love of whiskey. With me tonight, as always, is my good friend, Drew Crawley. What's up, Drew? Howdy, everybody. Not a whole lot, sir. How about yourself? Uh, I know that is not true. I know that is not true at all. Because it's had a full weekend. <laughs> you've got this out, right? Yes, sir. Just came out on Friday the 8th. So first single off an upcoming, as of yet, uh, untitled project. But wanted to go ahead and start putting out some of the stuff that we have done. So that is officially in the world. And can be streamed on Spotify and YouTube and Apple Music, correct? Yep. Yep. Wherever you find music, it'll be there. We've got uh, an acoustic version that'll be out next Friday and uh, some some upcoming shows uh, that I will start promoting this week as well. So um, we thought we had a full summer last month and now we have an even fuller summer. So it's exciting. Cool to have some momentum behind music again. Yeah. And people can still hit up uh, your first EP, Tower Songs. Yes. So just search Drew Crawley and he'll pop up and just listen to his stuff. You'll enjoy it, like it share it all that great stuff also with us tonight our guest host alan bishop spirits of french lick and the alchemist cabinet welcome sir yeah glad to be here again uh glad that you guys invited me back again and i didn't wear my welcome last time so <laughs> no we always love having you on it's always a lot of fun always a lot of fun and uh it, we, we've got uh, a, a wonderful distiller in his own right here with us as well. So hopefully we'll get into at least a little bit of uh, distiller on distiller action. Uh, I think that we may have to charge like 99 cents a minute for people to watch that, but um, <laughs> Some distiller there's an only fan page in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, before we get uh, more, uh, get to know Adam a little bit more, I want to tell you guys that we are a part of the bar cart co-op. The Bar Cart Co-op is a collective of really good friends who have some really good shows. One show is Distiller's Talk, which features none other than Mr. Alan Bishop and his co-host Christy Atkinson. Uh, my Whiskey Den, Monday nights, 9 o'clock with Mike and Patrick and Benjamin, and then our show, Bourbon Turntable. And you know us, so you love us, so nothing more to said about that. But we do have one more very special announcement for you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe. Hit that bell notification to find out when new episodes are coming out, which do, do come out every single Wednesday on all of the services, Spotify, Apple Music, Google, maybe Amazon, definitely YouTube. And always, always hit that like button, but hit it an odd number of times. So then that way it stays as a like. Everybody got a seal clap for my my tech team partner, Mike Vitek. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Hey, as I mentioned, we have with us a wonderful guest, the guy that uh, I've I've had the real blessing to get to know over the last few years. And um, he is not just a fantastic distiller. He's a wonderful guy, too. Uh, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in all of whiskey. And that is Mr. Adam Stump of Stumpy Spirits. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Excited to uh, to talk about whiskey and music. Yes. All right. So um, we have a couple of things that we're going to try of yours tonight. And the first of which is this Old Monroe straight wheat whiskey bottled in bond. Now, this thing, this little jewel came out in February. And uh, now I, I've got to say... Uh, Drew and, and Alan, be sure to start pouring that one if you haven't already. Um, this, uh, they're, they're on the left of the screen. Uh, those four barrels there, correct, Adam? Those were the, those housed this wheat whiskey for several years, correct? Yep, those, uh, those bottom four barrels there. Yeah, and that was always a treat when you get to visit and maybe get a little little taste of that. And, um, I'll tell you what you, what you've pulled together in, in, in blending it and, and getting it to this proof is, uh, is exceptional. Uh, so congratulations on that. Thank um, you. Thank you. Now this is your first bottled and bond project, correct? Uh, yeah, our first bottled and bond and, uh, it's an oddball to be a bottled and bond for sure, but, um, uh, that's, that's fine by us. So, uh, yeah, it was a super unique project. I mean, we can get more into that later, but, um, uh, we were we were incredibly excited to to be able to finally 
uh, be able to put Bottled and Bond mm -hmm. on one of the labels we put out. So this is the yeah, first one. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a Tremendous. big deal for, for, I think, most of us craft distillers is getting a Bottled and Bond out there. I mean, that was always, when I got to Spirits of French Lick, that was always the goal was, I don't know, even, even if you, it just always seems to me like that's the point where like, oh, we made it for four years, right? And we're somehow still in business. And now we have, you know, this this pinnacle that we've, we've gotten to the first of, of many pedestals, hopefully, right? And that's, that was, that was super exciting for me and has been for every one of the bottled and bonds that we've done. I'm sure it's the same way with you, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's weird because like, if you look commercially, bottled and bond isn't necessarily like the pinnacle of whiskey by yep. any stretch of the imagination, but- right. It is the highest mark of quality that the government says that they're going to stamp anything with uh, regulation wise. So, uh, yeah, you know, just to be able to have the opportunity to be able to hit that um, was was super exciting. So yeah. we got more of those uh, fun types of releases kind of planned out. But uh, it's a, like you said, Alan, it's a it's a big hurdle to, to hit that one and then uh, hopefully take the stride towards the next. So mm -hmm. I also think it's one of those things, too, where, you know, it's um <clears throat> It's kind of that point with uh, with certain whiskeys where people start to take you a little bit more seriously, right? Because you have made it for four years as opposed to, you know, it being a two-year-old or whatever, you know, people do ahead of time. But yep. there's just something to be said for the fact that the distillery was good enough that they even made it for four years to get to that point mm -hmm. to actually release something that has that kind of age on it. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. 100% agree with that. Yeah. I don't want to take away at all from the discussion of the whiskey. Uh, I know there's a lot of thoughts going around probably, but could you speak to just the logistical side of getting a bottled and bond product, how that works with warehousing specifically, what permits and stuff like that. I know that's maybe boring for some, but I've always been a little bit curious about that. Um, you know, from my background in the industry, it was all big boy, you know, major five distillery type stuff. And so it was never questioned, but as somebody who's had to kind of start that from the ground up, could you speak to what goes into that a little bit more? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, logistically, the, the first thing is laying down whiskey and then being patient enough to let it sit in a barrel for four years, which is probably the biggest challenge <laughs> on my part, I guess. Um, but uh, this, this whiskey in particular, I would say was a good target for bottled and bond for us because we did a, a wheat whiskey out of smaller barrels, pretty early on straight, but it was a, it was just a wheat whiskey. We had more laid down um, and we were, you guys have followed or some of you guys have followed along with the, uh, the story of the equipment and that stuff. So we've gotten into some challenging inventory situations um, mm -hmm. where we had to, you know, maybe bring some bourbon in a little earlier than we wanted to and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff just to be able to, uh, you know, make everything match up. Um, but we didn't have a like a staple in the market for that wheat whiskey per se. So it was a lot easier to let these barrels uh, just kind of sit there and do their thing and, and be really patient with those, um, along with a few other projects we have. But um, that's kind of how they got to that point. Um, they were conveniently located right by the door between the tasting room and the uh, the still house, though. So I would say they were probably the most frequently sampled barrels. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, the other thing, I mean, like the bonded warehouse and all that stuff, you know, yeah. with, with the way distilleries are, I, I would say, modernly um, kind of regulated, the, the warehousing piece doesn't doesn't make too much of a deal because like on our permit, all of our warehouse space is bonded. So, mm. um, you know, it, it, it just it lived its life in that warehouse. So that that, that portion of the, the law regulations may be a slightly out of date but um yeah that those barrels lived their lives at the distillery the whole time is basically what that piece means very cool not, very cool. not like it was pre uh pre-deregulation of bottled and bond you don't got a you don't got a guy there with an office that works for the uh for the ttv with a gun and a key to everything no that would be a colossal <laughs> waste of time at our distillery <laughs> right <laughs> yep yep i think it probably was at most of those distilleries back in the day <laughs> too more than likely right all right, so uh, guys, talk about uh, what you're getting on this uh, wheat whiskey. Mm. So one of the things, I, oh, go ahead, Drew. Sorry. No, go ahead, Al. You started. Yeah, uh, one of the things uh, just on the the aroma of this, Adam, um, and I had this before. I think last time that we we talked as well, we we kind of sampled this, and it it kind of stood out to me then. And I think I mentioned it, but I've targeted it a little bit more this time than I did last time. So last time I mentioned that kind of wheat bran aroma, right? Mm -hmm. But it's to me, it's like grape nuts. It's that kind mm -hmm. of Swedish cereal, you know, um, 
but obviously with the the you know the oak characteristic in there as well but very much so for me on the on the aroma it's like grape nuts it has that kind of wheat brand but some of that sweetness to it that comes through Mm -hmm. you know all the positive attributes of of what wheat has when it comes out of the field this has in the glass on the nose for me Mm -hmm. sure cool no i i really appreciate that That, that's interesting to hear because that's kind of how this experiment experiment was even born really is because um this was the point in time where we were just we laid down um, quite a bit of just single grain recipes uh, with some different variables attached to them to see, you know, specifically what does 100% wheat at low entry proof do? What does 100% wheat at high entry proof do? Mm-hmm. And and see, just make these things, let them age by themselves. And now we've got some empirical data to start um, yeah. basing some future decisions off of. And that's honestly how this was born. So um, yeah. it's that's. The cool thing to me, though, is like how much you can get out of that one single grain. Obviously, there's plenty of other impacts and variables. But, uh, yeah, the, the nose was I was I was always really surprised at the nose, I guess, for just being wheat, which is kind of a boring flavoring grain. Right. Well, I think that's an interesting thing here, too, is that there's not that many wheat whiskeys out there. Right. And I, th- I think there's there's always been a little a little bias towards wheat whiskey to some degree. Right. That it's you know, a tertiary product or whatever, but it doesn't have to be. And this proves it. And, and even for me on the palate on this too, for, for those who want to try this, um, it's not just, you know, people tend to think of wheat as being sweet. And sometimes it can have like with weeded bourbons, you can go into the kind of that like Philadelphia cream cheese sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. This isn't just that you get that initial kind of caramel and that sweetness, almost again, like a frosted sort of cereal sort of thing. But then at the end, there's a nice little bit of white pepper finish at the mm-hmm. back that comes across and it's got enough attitude to hold up. Like it's not one of those things that you're going to, you're going to sit down and just completely forget that you're drinking something. There's, there's very cool things happening texture wise on the back of the palate with this on top of that sweetness that you get up front and a very mm-hmm. nice contrast that happens. Yeah. The, uh, the, that little bit of spiciness on the back end, that, that was probably the most surprising piece of mm-hmm. this whiskey. I think uh, as, as we were, you know, tasting through the, the whopping four barrels that made up the, the lot for that dump. Um, but you know, that's just, that's one of those uh, adjectives that you don't generally see with wheat whiskey. Um, yeah. And I guess in my opinion, you don't often see in whiskeys that are either light or don't have any rye that are, you know, only four years old, not over that, you know, seven, mm-hmm. eight, nine year mark, mm-hmm. something like that, where some of the spice is pulling in from the wood and that kind of thing. So yeah. um, the other Interesting thing. So I mentioned there were a couple of variables we attached to this. So um, three of those barrels that were sitting on that rack that you showed there, Kevin, were entered at 93 proof. So um, absolutely asinine as a distiller to put whiskey in a barrel that low because, yeah, it, uh, I mean, we're basically aging water at that point. So not <laughs> not the most um, cost effective way to age whiskey, but uh, we wanted to see what it did at low proof. And then we had one barrel at 120 proof. So take the weighted average of all those um, and it comes out to right around 100 proof. So we're like, this is, this is the perfect set of four for a, uh, you know, near barrel proof bottled mm-hmm. and bond. So when yeah. We dumped those. I want to say we were, we were just high of 100. We were like 103, two or something like that after the dump. So there's very, very little water in there. That makes a, that makes a, a great deal of sense for a distiller too, to try to hit that as close as the bottled and bond is what you possibly, it's hundred proof is what you possibly can and not yeah. have to add any water because to me it always made more sense that you would age the water with the whiskey right that yep. the water becomes part of the whiskey and then you age it with it so mm-hmm. um i think that's awesome what yeah, so yeah. did you those lower proof entry those lower entry proof barrels um did they raise proof any uh yes they did um they they, they bumped slightly they bumped they were from 93 to anywhere from like 97 to 101 i think uh, nice. on the jump of those, the 120 for whatever reason, it 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 went pretty high. I forget what it was exactly, but yeah. um, it it was up there. That's the problem that we run into with our 105 entry on like the rye whiskey is it ends up in the other warehouse and it loses proof. So I mm-hmm. I get to play that fun game of all right, how many 98 proof barrels do I have mm-hmm. versus how many maybe 102 proof <laughs> barrels do right. I have exactly. to get there. So. Two. Uh, Drew, number, Drew, okay. what were your thoughts on it? Oh, yeah. No, uh, a lot of the same thing, actually, Alan said. It, it's very complex and kind of evolving through the palate. So 
it noses uh, a lot more on the heavy aromatics. I almost get kind of like a graham crackery thing. I like the like the frosted brain cereal note that Alan gave. Um, almost get kind of like a cowtail candy note as well, if you know what I'm talking about, those little cream-filled caramel things. Um, the palette really was brighter to me, almost like a stone fruity, maybe nectarine or peach, but kind of like a grilled flavor to it. It was like charred um, nectarine or charred peach kind of a thing. And then uh, some raspberry note as well. The back end, I loved. Uh, I was really surprised by that one. Um, I had had some other weeded whiskey earlier uh, this weekend, and it was pretty one note. Um, but this one in particular, I got like almost a wintergreen spice on the back where it really surprised me. Um, and I, I, I loved it. Just everything that you said already, Alan, I would agree with, but just picked out some different things from it uh, that really s stood out to me. Yeah. I can definitely see that stone fruit thing going back to it now as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's for sure there. Yeah. It's funny. Whenever we have the wheat in the bourbon mash bill, we'll tend to see like stone fruit, but cherry is one that usually comes up mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, and we don't really get that note when the rye is in that mash bill. So it's the exact same, except it's wheat instead of rye. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that comes across, across multiple recipes with that particular grain for us. Anyway. Interesting. Well, cool. I, th I, I think this is fantastic. I, I, I get a, a fair amount of brown sugar in it, um, and, and a little honey, a little leather. Uh, I, again, for one grain that is by reputation supposed to be the boring grain, <laughs> um, this is anything but boring. This is this is really fantastic, and um, it's kind of set. It kind of set me off on a rabbit trail of, of trying to explore other wheat whiskeys. And uh, yeah. I'm going to pair up with the guys on my whiskey den and, and do a blind wheat whiskey tasting for them later this year. And Very cool. Spoiler yeah. alert, this will be in the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, too, this would be a good one as well to uh, for, for another show sometime for some panel and find, uh, let's say, the Licorice Brothers get one of their corn whiskeys, 100% corn, right? And then have Adams 100% wheat. And then whoever on the rye side, you know, at 100% Leopold or whoever. Yep. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, that'd be a fun one to uh, to compare those categories, right? Or even a hundred percent oak whiskey would even be fun. So, oh yeah, I can. I can see the wheels turning over there. I see your pen out. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, this. Uh, you know, we've got so the the, the future of this. It, it's not just a one off. We're we're kind of we've got a plan for wheat whiskey uh, long term. Um, mm -hmm. The next release, we're we're debating on whether or not we're going to release one next year or skip a year and uh, take it out to, uh, you know, a little further. Um, but the next bottled and bond will be at least five or six mm. years old, depending on when we release that. Um, and then we haven't laid it down yet, but I'm, and this is maybe a, a segue, but uh, I've often wondered like playing around with mash bills and that kind of thing, uh, you know, what this would do if we mimic that uh, 1910 rye whiskey recipe kind of, uh, <clears throat> structure to it basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, we're hoping to lay down within the next, um, it'll probably be like September or so is when it's slated. Um, but 72% wheat, 25% malted wheat and 3% malted, um, barley to see, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what that does for a wheat whiskey as well. So that would be cool. Yeah. That'd be uh, very exciting. Cool. Now this, this wheat whiskey, is it, how much of it is malted wheat? Zero. It is Zero. 100 so percent straight wheat. Yep, you got it. Man. Which is really interesting, considering that kind of brand characteristic again. That's that's there. Mm -hmm. there there's no malted wheat in there, and you're you're getting that that much of that characteristic, that kind of earthiness out of it. It's awesome. Yeah, it, it's a. Uh, so when we this got milled through our old hammer mill, um, when we made the screen for that we literally got a screen made and then punched every other hole on every other row slightly bigger um to allow some larger chunks to come through yeah and hopefully allow a little more of that brain so just getting turned to dust basically and forming paste um try to let some of that come through and and actually end up as you know mm -hmm. uh just in the mash so yeah so you this not being a one-off and you're gonna you're gonna let the next one maybe ride a little bit longer so this is a question as a distiller to another distiller, because I'm kind of running into this, right? Like I have this, I have this concern. And so far we, 
with moving so much Lee Sinclair, it hasn't mattered, for example. But the first time I let Lee accidentally slip into five years, I'm not sure that I can come back off of that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So is that a, is that a concern that you're seeing with some of these things, too? Or Yeah, it is. I mean, once you kind of take that step, you almost like make the commitment, I feel like it, mm -hmm. if you're going to age state it. That is, you know, yeah. you know, before four years, you don't have to age state it, but if you're going to put the age on there, then yeah, it definitely matters. Um, yeah, no. like it matters even more with the bottled and bond because it has to be the single distilling season. It's not like you can yep. take four year, five year, six year and, and mm -hmm. blend it together. So, yeah, well, it, it, that's, that's one of those things that I run into with ours is being more on that traditional side and always trying to push them on the marketing side. Like, please put the age statement on there, right? Like yep. the Solomon Scott ride that's coming up, it's going to be, I was lucky enough to get them to hold on to it for five and a half, almost six years. So it needs to be age stated. But then the problem is once you age state it, then I can't ever release Solomon at four years. Cause it's going to be, somebody is going to say something or, or if you take the age statement off, they're going to say something about it. Right. right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of the, you know, the issue that you know, Knob Creek ran into had an age, age statement on things and they took it off and then, then they put it back on uh, Elijah Craig, same issues. Um, but I guess it, from a consumer standpoint, speaking to distillers, if I know and trust your product, if you put it on the, if you put it on the shelf to sell it and it's 28 months, I'm going to trust that it's good. And, yeah. uh, and I think that actually from a bourbon nerd standpoint i'd love to see some stuff side by side of mm -hmm. okay here here this is at you know 30 months and here it is at four years and here it is at six years same thing same mash bills same everything but mm -hmm. here it is i think that would be very interesting and and uh, i don't know if logistically if that's something that would just be a nightmare for you guys to pull off but uh, from from a consumer standpoint I think that would be a fascinating product to, to dive into. Well, it's, it's interesting because the reason I brought it up is because we're about to do the opposite thing there, which happened quite by mistake, which was we bottled half of the Maddie that we had for the last bottled and bond season and then held on to the other half. And now it's five plus years. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time. And I don't know, you don't hear distillers say this kind of thing very often, but it's not the exact same profile as it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's it's noticeable enough. And I, I think that that's not a bad thing necessarily for a craft distiller. I just I have my concerns about that going into the future because now it's slipped to five one time. Right. Is that going to be what's expected forever mm -hmm. or can I match that blend with poor? And I don't know if I can. So mm -hmm. did it have an extra summer on it? It did. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. At least a part of an extra summer anyways. So, yeah, uh, yeah it was it was a big, big difference between the four and the five for sure. So, um, yeah. So that's why, that's why I was curious what your thoughts on that were, because, uh, it's one of those things as a distiller that I don't have a great answer for. for yeah, I'll tell you what though, who did, who does, did and does it really well and, and did it just recently is wilderness trail. So like when they released that eight year, they were like, mm -hmm. like I think pretty well, everybody understood like, Hey, this is a, a very special release. You know, it's, yeah, it's the same labels, everything else that we do but this one's different because of its age yeah right. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so um i always have to ask about the the uh the the antique still as well is it still she's still she's still churning out for you still going well i i i cannot make enough beer to keep it fed <laughs> nice <laughs> it's, it's great we we pushed it as high as 20 gallons a minute and we outran the dry house when we did that wow. and <laughs> we've dialed it back though and we'll run mm -hmm. it normally like 11 and 11 or 11 to 11 and a half gallons a minute or so um and we'll still be done distilling by like 3 three thirty in the afternoon so it's it's like idling a, mm -hmm. a classic car that's got this big old giant engine in it you know never using the thing um but it's cranking out really, really, really um, great distillate. We're super, mm -hmm. super happy with with the quality that's coming off and um, also the flexibility that we were able to build into that thing as well. So 
we've we've plumbed we plumbed the doubler to where uh, it could actually be run as its own pot still as well. So uh, we've Very been cool. playing around with that and yeah, all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> so uh, what kind of capacity do you have with that right now? How many barrels are you able to fill in a week at this point? So we're normally the still is the bottleneck of any distillery production operation. That's how the distillery is designed. Um, the still is not our bottleneck right now. Cooling capacity is our bottleneck. Um, I can't mash and distill at the same time because that still just sucks down so much cooling. Um, and then it heats up. I've got, I mean, 8,000 gallons of cold water and a big chiller, but it heats that up to the point where it's not really feasible to cool a mash down to where I need it to at the moment. So, um, there's, there's a couple pieces to this question. So I'm going to try not to get sidetracked. So, um, <laughs> Right now, we mash three days one week, two days the following week, and then the distillation schedule is flip-flop. So we average two and a half mashes per week, which basically yields about 25 barrels a week wow. is what it is. So, I mean, it's nothing oh, yeah. crazy at all. Um, we're working on the cooling capacity side of things. That takes us up to um, – That'll move us to four mashes a week, four distillations a week, because that's all the fermenters we have. Um, and that is uh, basically 40 barrels a week from 25. Uh, we could stick in a fifth 4,500 gallon fermenter if we wanted to, um, but I don't think we will. I think we're going to hold the 40 barrels a week and just get to that point and we'll decide what we want to do from there. Um, if we want to put more capacity in it's going to be with a, a dedicated mashing and fermentation house um beyond the size of what we're able to to use right now so mm -hmm. um, short answer 25 barrels a week right now end of the year 40 barrels a week uh but even even running the slow number at 11 and a half gallons a minute of beer feed uh that still comes out to like if we would max that out at the slow speed that's like oh, 715,000 proof gallons a year um, and then you can almost double that just by speeding the mm -hmm. stills rate up. So it's long story short is this, this, the still will run as much as we want to feed it, but number one, I'm too poor. And number two, I don't have enough. <laughs> to still feed it, so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, was, barrels a week ain't nothing to sneeze at. That's for sure. Uh, that, that's, that's a good, good little amount there, buddy. Yeah, no, we're, I mean, we're, you know, it's <clears throat> pretty well, everything to four years, pretty well at this point. Um, but the, the goal is to push up to eight years. So just mm -hmm. try to lay down the inventory to, to be able to do that and then be able to expand markets and, and all that stuff. So, um, and we've been running uh, really kind of, I shouldn't say this more than I'd like uh, contract stuff, but um, it, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it, it's kind of built into the, to the mm -hmm. business model now and it's just, it, mm -hmm. it, it works, it works well. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's money there. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta pay for all the fun toys and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Those invoices go on net 30. I don't have to wait for them, you know, four or five years in a wreck house. <laughs> to, uh, come around. Right. Nice. Now, so let's talk a little bit about expansion plans. Cause I know uh, a little under a year ago, you were working with uh, your local governments and zoning boards and all the really fun things that, that, small business owners enjoy yeah, and sometimes. ultimately ultimately you were successful in getting approval for your plans yep and uh, this was this was something that i pulled off of uh, one of your uh, facebook posts about this project I, I don't know if this is actually uh, associated with what you're doing or if this is some sort of mock-up from the data invasion that <laughs> or, yeah, or why, right. but, uh, um, but you, you've got some good things uh, in the works, and, and I know those plans have changed a couple of times along the way. So where are you now with that? Yeah, so uh, they did change a couple of times along the way. I feel like always for the better, um, and we are continuing to plow forward with that project. Um, and it, it's crazy because like we've had to kind of pump the brakes a couple of times just because of other things going on. The first of those being COVID, you know, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, but um, number two, uh, most recently, uh, we actually took the packaging and co-packing and private label side of our business 
and split it off of the distillery, formed its own company and moved it to a building. Actually, if you pop that map up, Kevin, you can probably see the building on it. We, we were fortunate enough to uh, acquire a building in that little uh, industrial park uh, right there um, with a couple of partners and move all of our packaging stuff up there and uh, really expand our co-packing operations. So um, that, that kind of took a little bit of a precedent um, just time-wise. Um, but we are really cruising right now on this particular project, um, the, the visitor experience mm -hmm. uh, kind of expansion, I'd say. Um, I would say we're about 95% of the way done with the plans. It's sort of that, that really tedious part where the architect, the civil, the MEP, the structural, and all those guys are like coordinating the final model to put it together and then uh, submit for permits. So um, long story short, I'm hoping within four to six, no more than eight weeks, we've got plans done, done, done. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving on to uh, building permits after that, probably I, the county is going to take their time with these, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, just to make sure everything, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, I. I hope we're breaking ground uh, this fall. Uh, okay. You know, late this fall is, is kind of the plan right now. And there's there's a lot of things that are wrapped into this project that I feel like have changed for the better. So number one, the location is way better. Uh, number two, that big chunk of woods on there. Um, the lakes are not existing. They're going to be. Um, we're going to be building those here pretty soon. But just recently, we harvested 234 trees. Out of that parcel of timber, the vast majority of them were white oak. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of those logs went to ISC. Um, ISC, they're just so big that they can't separate our logs from other people's logs. Um, they just go into the process. But uh, we do work with Zach Cooperage down in Kentucky as well. Mm -hmm. And the Zimlick family is absolutely awesome. So they've got some of our uh, wood sitting down there, uh, air drying right now that uh, they're going to turn into our whiskey barrels and then ship back to us. So uh, that's, that's cool. Gonna be really cool. Yeah, that's a yeah. You know, it's single source grain going into our wood agent. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. we're we're super excited about that, and you know, really fortunate to be able to work with uh, a cooperage like Zach Allen. I know you're really familiar with those guys um, to to be able to bring a project like that to life. So um, you know, that was kind of an unexpected thing that that happened. And the other thing is. The building's kind of morphed a little bit. So you walk in the front doors, full service tasting room, bar, all that fun stuff. You got the big event venue in the back, obviously. Um, upstairs, bright suite, groom suite, offices, blah, blah, blah. Downstairs, there's a, a pretty well a full basement in there, but there's a lower level venue as well. It, it'll still, it's a lot smaller than the upper one, but it'll still hold about 100 people. Much more like speakeasy, loungy type feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're also going to be doing a like bottle your own experience, uh, mm -hmm. down there as well during the week, whenever that's not booked out. So, um, some really, really cool opportunities that we're able to do there. And then, um, we're also working right now, not a done deal yet, but we're working on a very unique Rick house design, um, traditional, but unique. Uh, relative to most of the other things that are out there in the market um, and putting a, a, a much larger rick house on that property as well um, to, to hopefully house some of these barrels because we're going to be full in our little one here uh, pretty soon. And I'm getting kind of nervous about where the barrels are going to go. <laughs> it's Those good are problem. good problems to have. Yeah. 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 So yeah. At, at what point are you going to learn how to blow glass? Because that's about the only thing that you're missing from <laughs> you'll, saying you'll that laugh, every, everything laugh. is is yours because you um, do the grain. Uh, you've got now you've got the wood. Uh, He's so. got to find that sand deposit on the property first. <laughs> well, when he finds that Toronto, sand deposit. Toronto it's all is only an hour from us. Uh, the Park Hills <laughs> plant is like less than an hour uh, just across the river. So, uh, but you'll laugh. I was already on Alibaba and sending folks <laughs> out to check on um, you know imported glass equipment. And I'll tell you that I'm not selling near enough bottles to pay for the capital requirements that are associated with that part of the process. Now, the, the lowest quote for like a super like manual operation, like not even really semi-automatic, like mm -hmm. very manual was well into the seven figure range. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, they can keep that, I guess. Uh, yeah, but it, it, the, the, the whole grain to glass uh, 
uh, issue doesn't need to be uh, uh, ignored. And, and I didn't mean to, to just to, to pass over that because I think it's very mm-hmm. significant that you your your distillery is on your family's farm, correct? Yep, you got it. And, and every grain that you use in your whiskey is grown on that farm, right? Literally every kernel. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's a, it, it was a long time to get there and um, some not so great crops and all kinds of stuff, but mm-hmm. we feel like we've kind of hit hit a stride at least on the uh, the ag side of being able to supply really um, what we need. And we've been really fortunate with, uh, number one, our family's amazing. Like, I don't specifically own any farming equipment. My dad, my uncle, and, and you know, my family does, but they let us use it to farm the ground that we, um, you know, rent and have for the distillery. So, um, you know, without the family, we wouldn't be able to do that. So family's kind of been wrapped into the whole thing from the start, you know, whether you talk about the family farm or literally the people that helped get it off the ground. I mean, my dad's there. If it's raining and it's not in harvest, my dad is at the distillery and not at the farm. And Mm -hmm. shoot, the other day he was outside hammering rings back on barrels and swelling barrels and you name it. So uh, yeah, we're super fortunate in that regard. Um, And, you know, I I think that's probably almost the piece of the, the entire thing that, uh, you know, is the most rewarding probably is being able to wrap in the family and the farm and, you know, our, really our family's legacy. Mm-hmm. We didn't come from generations of master distillers. We came from generations of farmers. So mm-hmm. uh, hopefully that continues for generations. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got two, two young ones there. Are, are they, uh, do they hang out at the distillery? Are you? Oh, they do. It sounds like they're having a rager upstairs right now. <laughs> <laughs> crazy up there. So just build this pill. It's okay. <laughs> They're getting closer. Charlotte's only uh, four. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they are there quite a bit. Uh, you know, it's funny since Charlotte's probably been, she, since she's been able to talk, barrel was literally one of her first words. I feel like <laughs> um, she always, every time she said, Dan, let's go see my barrels. They are her barrels. Let's go see my barrels. Oh, I love it. Okay. I love it. As it should be. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I know cool. that I know Alan can relate to that as well. <laughs> he has a little distiller at his house. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have one that, that I'm pretty sure knows as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's pour this uh, rye. Um, and I want to just... Th- this is uh, seriously one of my all-time favorite whiskeys. It is um, a 1910 style uh, rye, uh, 72% rye 25 percent malted rye three percent malted barley and this is aged uh 27.2 months yeah we count them in tents whenever we're that low Kevin. yep that's yeah. fine <laughs> count it count it however you want and um i, I again i just i just I was going to save this till the next batch was out, but uh, I, I didn't do that. Uh, but so my que- first question is, when's the next batch going to be out? <laughs> uh, the the next batch will be this old this year. Um, I don't think we're going to release it this year, though. Yep. Um, I think we're going to wait a little bit longer. Um, but we did get a, kind of a sneak peek at it. We actually uh, just entered... Uh, we, we dumped one and put it into a uh, super cool finishing barrel too, out of the the, the first lot that's going to come available of this. So mm-hmm. um, it's it's coming along really nicely, and I, you know, I get a lot of similar characteristics out of you know this pour out of this bottle. Mm-hmm. That shoot, how long ago was this? This has been a couple years already. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Man, that is crazy. Good, crazy, it's super good. <laughs> Thank hmm. you. I need some help here. I don't want to sidetrack anything, but there's almost a vegetal note. It's not cucumber. It's not zucchini. It, it's not earthy. It's specifically like in the vegetable world. And I've never really picked that up on a rye whiskey. It's usually something I only get in malt whiskeys. Can either, any of you guys help me out there? What am I tasting? So I don't, I don't, I don't get the vegetal. What I get though is like, are you, you familiar with like the, the red, like the blood plums? Yeah, like real, yes. yeah, like that, that okay. right there on the, where the skin is at on a blood plum, that kind of, yep. I don't know what you call it, but that membrane is cool. It's, yeah, it's, it's tart, but it's got like a darker component to it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah, Man, that's delightful, Adam. Holy Thanks. crap, man. 
<laughs> it's it's super bright too. Like you, you do have on the palate, you have that again that kind of blood plum thing. But the entire experience from the aroma all the way down the palate is very very bright, and it's a it, that's a, that's a pretty viscous whiskey right there. That is a mm -hmm. heavy bodied whiskey. Uh, sure. That that came off the pot still. Yeah, so it's a uh, it, it's been a bit of a challenge uh, when we ran that off of the the continuous that we designed. Um, we ran the column hotter specifically to try to get some of those to get that. come over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I've not run this off the new still yet, but based on the other stuff we've run, I, I think it's going to be a lot easier to achieve those oils off this new still than it was mm -hmm. even the, the one we designed that one, that column liked to run cold. Uh, this, this one from Belgium. I mean, you could damn near have water at the top of the stripping column. I feel like if you wanted to, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, you, it's you sometimes a challenge to get those those kind of those fatty textures out of column stills for sure. So, but I think with that setup you have, if you, I think you have the possibility of easily being able to do that for sure. So, yeah, we we did a couple other little things to it uh, that will allow us to to get some of those oils in there um, a little better. It's we kind mm -hmm. of we we set it up to where it can run hot enough that you can almost have to have a slobber box on it uh on the top yep. but then i don't want to give too much away either um like it, it, we can <laughs> run a lot of that down we can push a lot of that straight into the doubler we don't have a, a slobber box per se yep. and we've been able to achieve that even at the lower feed rates that we're running so mm. um Rise honestly the easy to, easiest to do it on though because it's so freaking foamy anyway. It wants to yep. kind of work its way up the column anyway. So absolutely. Yeah, well, that, I was going to throw throw this out to you as just a, a distiller's theory, and I don't know it may may or may not interest you, but one of the things that you might look at with that is you've got access to that that doubler, right? Um, you could put a little raw rye grain in there as well, and try yeah. to pull some of that oil out of that raw rye grain just by steam infusing it would be pretty interesting. Yeah, for sure. We. We have thought about that, and I, I've not thought about it long enough to to be brave enough to try it. I don't think I. Fair enough. I, but no, I, I I'm very interested to get your thoughts on that too because I've yep. never I've never thumped or doubled with anything that wasn't already like partially refined at least. So yep. Uh, Yep. I have absolutely no experience with that. So I'd be very coarse, very coarse grind. That's, that's, that's what you want. No, you don't want anything real powdery or anything like that. And, um, you don't even necessarily need a whole lot of it. Um, uh, you know, on, a, on the column though, I, and you know, I'm not a, I'm not a column guy, so I, I don't want to speak from any kind of experience there, but figuring out how to be able to continuously add some of that as you go as well. Right. Having some yeah. kind of way to load that in as you go through the distillation would be helpful. I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm. You got my wheels turning, Alan. I'm not going to sleep tonight. There you go. There's there's another there's another opportunity for you to patent a piece of equipment. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to come over and show me how it's done, though. That's cool. We can do that. I got I got tri clothes and valves. We can make this happen. There we go. <laughs> Adam, if if you can share and and feel free to tell me no, but what were the entry proofs on this one? Because it is so viscous. Uh, one twenty. Um, one twenty. Okay. Yeah, I uh, my wheels are turning a little bit, and and I'm a consumer, but I also love to cook, and I would love to pair this with some Greek food, with you know the bitter herbs, the fat from lamb, some of the the tart from some of those sauces and stuff. I, this would stand up great, and I think really enhance some of those flavors. I would love to give that a try. Cool, it's yeah, just that, that great. The only other rye whiskey that I've had that is on that again, you get that that kind of blood plum thing coming across. But it's on that verge of the same thing that I like about the uh, the limestone branch malted rye, Kevin. Mm. That that fruity, bright sort of thing. Yeah. They're 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 they have they're not the same, obviously, but there are similarities between the two, yeah. right? One leaning mm -hmm. a little bit more peach, and one leaning a little bit more blood plum. But again, both having that stone fruit characteristic, yeah. and and wow. being not the same characteristic as most ryes, you you usually get to try. Yeah. You hit the, I think, Alan, I think you hit the uh, the nail on the head. I think the malted rye is the common denominator, and I feel like that's what really makes this one stand out, mm -hmm. um, along with the limestone branch, because uh, I think a long time ago, several years ago, 
you maybe got a sample of our rye. It was the, it was a 100% rye and uh, it was a pretty good representation of a lot of like what our rye grain does. It's, it's surprisingly fruity and not as spice forward as mm -hmm. you know, what commercially available things are. So okay. um, I, I find your tasting notes very interesting and, and kind of almost in line with um, you know, what we think, what we've theorized that we're getting out of our rye anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, the malted rye, I feel like, is the, the silver bullet in this particular. You're nailing place. it on, the, on this thing, man, 100,000%. Yeah. Now, uh, to the extent it would be dangerous for me to have a bottle of this, just yeah. like it is to have a yeah. bottle of its own branch. I, I'm going to hide this bottle after the show. So, because <laughs> <laughs> if I don't, it won't last. Um, yep. the, it doesn't drink like a rye, mm -hmm. when, of what you traditionally think about a rye. But I've put this in blind tastings with uh, like very popular high profile rise, will it rise, even wilderness trail rye uh, and uh, rise from heaven hill. And this wins every single time. Mm. It is it's it's the king of the category. There's just not enough of it. Oh, I, I certainly appreciate that. I'd, I'd love to get your guys' opinion, too. So we put this in the barrel at 120 proof, which is atypical of what we do now. So we enter everything pretty well in that 110-ish range. Um, I, wh everything I've got of this right now is at 110. I've been contemplating, though, on this year's production doing 100 proof 110 proof and 120 proof uh what is what are your guys's takes on entry proof of let, where it's at and where you think it would be at a lower entry let, let me make one more co one, one co quick comment and then uh, i'll let alan who's gonna know a lot more of the technical side of this you put this in at 120 it came out at 119.6 and that's barrel strength, correct? Yep. So it basically held proof the 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 entire twenty seven months that it was in the barrel, right? Sure. Which is, I think is very interesting as well. So, yeah, that one uh, that one lived. Where did that barrel live? That barrel lived uh, right across from where the wheat whiskey was aging for the vast majority of its life. Uh, kind of on that wall when you walk in the distillery yeah. to the right there were a bunch of barrels laying like kind of an old dunnage house like literally barrels on the floor then two by fours barrels are four by fours barrels on top of those um and that's where those live for a while so it didn't see any kind of crazy like rickhouse conditions like mm -hmm. like what we've got out there right now i think it would be I, I think this is beautiful where it's at absolutely i think it would be interesting if you did one in that 105 110 range that because I'm, I'm curious with that first of all this has got a crazy again a crazy body to it um and again that's probably partially the pot still thing going there but that fruit ester i'm curious what it would do if you destabilize that alcohol a little bit during the mat maturation process and and the esterification process as process it would go to go through at a lower proof mm -hmm. if you'd still be in that blood plum range and then the other side of that is you might end up in that again limestone branch peach sort of range mm -hmm. right i think it'd be yeah. interesting just to just to do two of them at two different proofs like that and see see what happens with it mm -hmm. I, I was so excited i was like i'm like man we're really nailing like consistencies and barrel profiles and all that and then like you try one thing now and you try one thing what you did a while back and you're like man yep. there's somewhere in between here that would be kind of cool man I, I have the same problem. I tend to hate 95.5 rise and we've got some hundred percent rye that I was like, we're never making that again. And it's really, really good. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. that, that's, that's what I, I love about what you guys do is you can try different things. You're willing to try different things and, and, mm -hmm. and play around with things, experiment and see what you come up with. And, you know, I think you both got to, pretty strong track record uh of success so uh, uh trust your judgment <laughs> yeah. trust tr trust your whims uh it's gotta be fun yeah yeah hey let's uh we'll 
let's kind of start to transition over to, to some some music stuff here. Uh, so we're going to kind of wrap up side A of this and uh, head over to side B here in just a couple minutes. But first, we were going to we always do a little commercial in the middle of our, every show. And we, we promote a lot of different things. But tonight, we're going to be pretty selfish and promote ourselves. <laughs> so tell you about some, some upcoming shows that we've got. Uh, Hunter Coffee uh, is going to be on from, from Three Boys Distillery. He's a, a, a fascinating guy, works with a ton of different mash bills. So it'll be a lot of fun to talk with him. We're going to do a show on whiskey in the movies and talk about movie soundtracks. Uh, we've... Uh, got steve gorman who was the drummer for the black crows he's going to be on uh later this summer uh lenny Eckstein from deer hammer distilling out in colorado will be joining us brian hara bourbon justice he wrote a book called bourbon justice and talked about some of the legal issues uh and lawsuits that have happened in bourbon through the years and we're going to talk with him about that plus talk about some of the lawsuits that have popped up famously uh in the world of music and we will have our one year anniversary show on September 7th. So we've got a lot of really great shows coming up, I think. <clears throat> so tell your friends, tell your neighbors, uh, tell your enemies. I don't care. Uh, get them to, to sign on, like, share, subscribe, all that great stuff. And uh, don't miss out. I think we've got some fun stuff for everybody. Uh, so tune in, please. A great lineup. It's a great Thank lineup. You. Thank you. I think so, too. Appreciate it. We've been very yeah. fortunate. People have been very kind to to be willing to be on just like uh, you guys have so but we want to talk a little bit about music with adam and um so first question what was the first album that you ever got that you ever bought yourself that i ever bought myself mm -hmm. mm, different than the first album i'd ever gotten uh so their their cds were live at this point the first one I ever paid money for, I think, was The Wallflowers, I want to mm. say. Okay. Very good. Yeah, that was a, I forget the name of the album. I can picture it. It's like a, one almost headlight. 80, and it's got stars on it, and it's the one that one headlight was on. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. That's a good yeah. start. Uh, Much better than my first album. So props to you. I <laughs> had. <laughs> That's Jacob Dylan. So you got Bob Dylan's kids. So yep. that's, not, that's not bad. No. Nope. Uh, and uh, what was that album called? I don't remember. God. Oh, bring, Bringing Down the Horse, wasn't it? Was that it? I don't remember. God, it's been a long time. I'm going like to Google. Anytime that, uh, that intro comes on, though, it's like, I mean, it's nostalgic. Like, you think of, you know, what was going on in life that first, you know, whenever you first yeah. got that, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. The, the first album, Wallflowers album was called the Wallflowers. Um, and the second yeah. one had, bring uh, uh, bring it, was bringing down the horse. Yeah. Mm. It had uh, six, six Avenue heartache, another great song. One yeah. headlight. Yeah. Yeah. To be, to be clear, we are not saying bringing out the whores. Right. No, we're not, we, okay. we are not singing "Bringing Out the Whores." That is an entirely different album altogether. That's, that's my that's my first album, <laughs> the one that I'm going to write and record. That is enough. If you ever need a guitar player for that, Alan, you know who. To <laughs> I'll let you know, Drew. Yes, absolutely. Our collaboration. I'm going to play the electric harpsichord on that. <laughs> Oh, golly. Uh, Adam, do you remember your first concert? Uh, first concert, I vaguely remember. Um, it was Garth Brooks. I'm trying to think. Oh, wow. If there's a, uh, he was in St. Louis. It, it was on the, you know, it was in the 90s when his, it was the, the crazy Garth, you know, jumping on top of speakers. And I mean, yeah. I, I was single digits old for sure. And like, I still remember that concert and like the energy that, that was at that show. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Garth's known for his, uh, live performances. That's for sure. Yeah. He, he puts on a great show. show. He puts on a real show. Yeah. All right. So how long have you and Laura been married? Um, it will be 10 years this September. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, and that, that was probably not 
that was probably an unfair question. I didn't mean to spring that on you because it could have been kind of embarrassing. But you you, you came through with an answer. So I made it up. But I think it's about <laughs> right. I didn't hear her in the background go. Eh. If, if, if you find out later that it's something different, let me know and I'll edit this before yes, it gets out. Do, um, but do you did do, do the two of you have a song? Uh yeah, we did. Um, and it, it's funny because like. I, our music taste and genres and everything we've listened to has, it's just been a roller coaster throughout life and our time together and all that stuff. But the one song that's always kind of like been our song, um, uh, you know, from really God, I mean, when we were kids, like high school to, it was our, our first song that we danced to at our wedding uh, was Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. It's your love. So mm -hmm. that's kind mm -hmm. of been a, the one constant song for sure. Okay. Great, Tan. Great. Yeah. So you say that you, you kind of had uh, some ups and downs or some twists and turns in, in your musical taste over the years. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. What, 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 <laughs> looking back, is there anything that you're like, I'm a little embarrassed that I, that I bought that album or went to that concert or like that song? Not really. Like, I'll, I'll get, shit on probably for some of them but i mean it, it, it's funny because like my parents had different musical tastes too and like so like my dad was classic rock 100 percent all the way it was skinner allman brothers marshall tucker band boston i mean you name it um your dad's mom, a good man your dad's yes a good man. <laughs> yes right um and, and i would say that's like that's what i remember listening to the most growing up i think and what, what kind of what I kind of gravitated towards. I remember the first time whenever I understood how a radio worked and I could pick what kind of music came out of it. Um, I would always choose like country esque music. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, me personally, I always kind of gravitated that way, but then, you know, mom is kind of, she, she's the, the, the person who got us to and from where we were going you know, forever growing up. And, you know, we listened to what mom listened to. And yeah. hers was always like, you know, what was popular at the time as far as like pop is concerned, right? That kind of stuff. So, um, but it, it's funny because, you know, the country I've always liked, I would say, I mean, for the most part, um, mm -hmm. classic rock has not changed. I feel like classic rock is still classic rock, except I heard uh, the other day, I heard Everlong come on as on the classic rock station. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts. Um, but then uh, now anymore, it's uh, like, it's funny, like, as you get older, like how you start categorizing the, the music you like. I'm like, who would I pay money to go see right now? And like, yes. uh, for, like my my favorite right now is uh, Whiskey Myers. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you know, a lot of the. I, it's, it goes by a few names, Texas country, red dirt, whatever. But uh, mm -hmm. I listen to a lot of it, but I find myself kind of listening to the guys that have a lot more guitar, um, kind of more like Southern rock, bluesy kind of influences, um, mm -hmm. Whiskey Myers, uh, Blackberry Smoke, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you name it. So, yeah, Charlie yep. Star is like one of the most yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I Have just you... saw Myers about three weeks ago live, <laughs> and man, they crushed. They're they're fantastic. That's awesome. Same thing with Blackberry Smoke. They put on a, a great, great, great show. Yeah. Charlie Star can play with anybody. I feel like and put on a great. I I've seen like I don't know how many hours of YouTube I've watched of like Charlie Star with Government Mule, and then that goes. You know, there's just so many things. Um, I saw. Uh, we saw Cody James recently. He put on an awesome show. One person, though, that so he opened for Cody Jinx, and I always thought that this guy would be just out of this world phenomenal was Randy Rogers. And he put on a good show, but he very much played like the opening act. And I felt like before that, I would have I was like Randy Rogers was on my list of people to go go pay money to go see. And then, you know, after that, I was like, man, I'm kind of disappointed. He came out and like. It's like you listen to the radio with Randy Rogers on it, and that was it, you know. So it's it's kind of missing that uh, that heart and soul piece. But I guess that's almost you got to you got to make the headliner look good too, right? <laughs> that's right. Kind of the way that works, I guess. Have you have you ever listened to the, a band called the Steelwoods? The Steelwoods. Steelwoods. Yeah. 
I'm yep. sure I probably have. It sounds familiar. But it is. It, it, it kind of fits that uh, Southern rock country vibe that you're talking about. Nice. There's really good stuff. Really good stuff. Steal it. I'm going to yeah. check them on. Um, Putting it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do you find uh, new music now? Lord, how do I find new music now? Um, it's weird. You kind of get siloed almost like on the streaming services. Um, I, I, I have no idea why, but Pandora just seems to be the app that I open the most mm -hmm. of, I think. Um, and it it doesn't do that great of a job of mixing things up, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, so honestly, for me, it's generally whenever I'm with someone else, whether it's mm -hmm. you know, in somebody else's truck or at their house or you know whatever so um I, I would say that's probably how um i get introduced to to new music but you know it, it's kind of funny though because that's still kind of silo too because i in general hang out with people that listen to a lot of the same music that i do so <laughs> sure sure yep. uh, if you could go back in in time who would you want to see live that you never got a chance to see? Skinner. Skinner. <laughs> not not even a question. Like like, like real real Skinner. Yes. Right. Yes. Not not right. like the current iterations that. Yeah. Are, no. Exactly know, right. Real right. Skinner. Yeah. Be, before the plane crash, Skinner for yeah. sure. Yes. Pre pre plane <laughs> crash, Skinner. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's. I mean, that's like. I mean, you know, that's one of those groups that I grew up listening to, and I mean turn any song on the radio or turn any song on off any album. And, you know, I may not know all the words, but I, I'll at least be humming the, uh, the music to it. For right. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's, there's one for you. Uh, so if you, if you got to go see pre playing crash Skinner and you got to hang out with him, what bottle of whiskey are you taking? Ooh. <laughs> mm. I don't know. That's a, <laughs> Could be I don't playing that side right. along with that, with that thumper question. That doubler question. Yeah. Damn. God. I got to ponder on that one, Alan. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, the, the plane crash was in 77. Yes. So are we are we talking about whiskey that would have been present in 77, or you can take back anything? Anytime? You got the DeLorean and Doc Brown. You can take anything you <laughs> want. Oh, my God. Right. More options. <laughs> I feel like that's an old granddad hangout. I then, I was like, I'm in that realm for sure. Yeah. I'm gonna say '70s turkey, but yeah, the OGD right. would be pretty good too. Yeah. What I think, was OGD back then? Oh, back then it probably would have been what, '86. '86. Yeah, no, they. Yeah, probably. I have to look. No, they were. The, yeah, they were doing bottled bond on that as well back then. Um, Probably would have been national distillers at the time. Mm -hmm. So, bottled and bond probably would have been some of the higher proof stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking been... about this the other day, and this is, I completely digress, but when did the barrel proof stuff start becoming like commercially available? The bookers? Like late 90s, Probably. early 2000s bookers? Yeah. He, they were probably one of the first. I would, yeah, they, with bourbon, I would say that way. Yeah, I would say that's that's when it really started to catch on. Was like late nineties, early two thousands, somewhere in there. As far as like the people that were really into it, and you started to see it a little bit more commonly, more than likely. Um, at least in the bourbon world, it seems to be that way because it, it seems to be a fairly new phenomenon. Isn't it funny though too that that proof just keeps going up? And yeah, the consumer yeah, just keeps going. Like, Jesus right. Christ. Right. Yeah. How many Jack Daniels that they announced last week? Like 146 or something? It was, yeah. it was over 150. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I'm taking advantage of it, man. That's why we released that high proof apple brandy. <laughs> if they'll buy mm -hmm. high proof apple brandy, they'll. It, that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> yep. Crazy. Sorry. I digress. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's a good digression. Uh, I think a bottle of Booker's would be pretty fun to to hang out with Skinner with. 
<laughs> you might need more than one bottle. You but, definitely uh, need more than one bottle. Yeah. And I think they would, yeah, yeah they, they would be more fucked up on the, uh, at least from the whiskey, maybe, than normal if they were used to drinking 86 proof. <laughs> right. Yeah. I feel like, though, too, just to be, just to be fair, right, and all the respect in the world to Skinner. But I think they'd probably be okay even if you just showed up with some Kesslers, right? I'm just, you know, I don't, I don't feel like they'd be too awful picky about about yeah. what they were drinking. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think that they would be uh, uh, the Van Zants would be very happy to drink whatever, whatever you brought them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, you say today you're you're kind of more on the the country side of things. Um, yep. so if, if we get in your truck and we're, we, we meet you at the distillery, we're getting your truck, we're going to drive up to the, to the, uh, the future site of, uh, the event center. Uh, what are we going to be hearing, uh, as we're driving there? Uh, it's probably going to be something along the lines, whiskey Myers, Cody Jinks, uh, John party comes up quite often, mm. Parker McCollum, uh, a lot of a lot of that stuff uh for sure uh have you gotten on the the coulter wall and zach bryan train are you yeah, are you yeah. Man I, I heard, uh the zach bryan song was it something in the orange yes yeah, yeah. The, yeah. I, i've seen so much stuff about it but i actually like sat down and listened to it for the first time the other day and i was like holy shit this is deep like one God. of the better divorce songs out there you know it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you just have kind you... of getting into there? But then um, there's also a, a pretty decent chance that the Pandora Station would be one of two other things. It would either be Leonard Skinner Radio, which I mean anything along those lines, yeah. or I've got Foo Fighters Radio on there as well. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think it really some of that, that '90s, 2000s stuff for sure. sure. It's only uh, only tangentially country music related, but you're you're a farm boy as well, just like I grew up that way. Uh, so I got I got to ask. So, uh, square body, 80s, Ford or Chevy. Where are you going? What are you doing? I've still got two square body, <laughs> 70s Ford sitting in dad's shed. <laughs> See, I, knew, I knew he'd have an answer to that. I absolutely knew he would. My first truck was a uh, 79 F250, and wow. it still Good runs. I, I once had to – I dumped coffee and had to pee on the brakes to get a brake fire out. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a good truck. <laughs> oh <my God>. Fantastic. <laughs> that's the way those that, trucks that, work. That's a country, that's a country song right there. <laughs> had had Chevy, up, uh, had 80, the Chevy, Chevy, Chevy Scottsdale. Dad put a 350 in, and I'm pretty sure that it had about 18 dents in the roof where I jumped the old bridges, and my friend's head's gone way to school with you <laughs> every morning. That's what you get for not putting the seatbelt on. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Um, did you talked about Cody Jinx? Have you listened to his rock album, his rock band? No, it's called Caned by Nod. C A N E D sure. by Nod. It came out. I don't. Right at around the same time, like within a week of his last country album, he came out with his rock album. Hmm. It's it's pretty good stuff. How See, I not know about you, you need to listen to Bourbon Turntable where you learn about new music. That's what you yeah. need to do. This is what I'm telling you. I don't know. Oh my god! I'll tell you, tell you the I other, the other tonight. This is unbelievable. The other back channel for getting new music from Kevin is just next time you get drunk and you're on YouTube and you find a song you like, drunkenly send a YouTube video, and then it just becomes a war. You just, <laughs> <laughs> that is not a lie. I love nope. it. That is not a lie at all. <clears throat> that rye is so damn good. Thank yep. <laughs> so so Adam's going to be up all night listening to Cody Jinks' rock album and thinking about distillation uh, changes on, on making this rye. Um, apologies Drinking with Leonard Skinner <laughs> and whether or not he could buy a Chevy Scottsdale and put a 350 in it. <laughs> Oh, so, depending on how much rye this drink, or how much of this rye I drink, uh, mm. I might be afraid to look at my eBay purchases tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my wife controls all the finances. I have no debit card, no nothing. Mm -mm. I don't need that. I don't need those problems in my life. <laughs> 
smart man, smart man. I know his wife, and and she would, uh, she'll take care of that stuff for him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Got to get him home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to kind of start wrapping things up here a little bit. Um, and first thing we want to do is uh, let Adam share where people can find him on social media, find his distillery and all the stuff that they've got going on there. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and now TikTok uh, at Stumpy Spirits and uh, StumpySpirits.com. Fantastic. Uh, Alan, where can everybody find you? Uh, spirits of French lick.com, sealbox.com, uh, one piece of time distilling and stoop videos on YouTube and, uh, distillers talk podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. and Drew. Awesome. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Drew Crawley 63, Instagram at Drew dot Crawley 63. That's going to be primarily where the music stuff is Twitter. I'm just mostly being sarcastic. So mm -hmm. <laughs> choose your viewing experience. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> Now, now, one one thing I want to say <clears throat> about what Stumpy Spirits does uh, on their social media. Whoever the 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 people that run that for you, Adam, are Laura. fantastic. Yeah, that's my wife. Yeah. Okay, Laura, <laughs> Laura, Laura is great. And then I know that you've got some of some of your other employees that will do like the cocktail videos. Yep. Katie, yep, absolutely terrific, terrific stuff. Um, and well worth a follow just for, for that. Uh, so be sure to, to, to latch on to, to Adam and Stumpy Spirits on all the social media accounts. Really good stuff. Uh, as for, for me, just follow us on Bourbon Turntable. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Uh, you'll get notifications on all of our shows. Plus, we'll post stuff that may be some new music. It may be some anniversaries of things like today, uh, as we're recording this today would be the 80th birthday of Ronnie James Dio. So I had a nice little post on him. Uh, but you can subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can always see the shows. If you prefer to listen as opposed to watching, uh, you can find us on your favorite podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, Google. Uh, so just check us out. Uh, I think you'll like what we've got going on. And if you don't, leave us a comment and tell us how we can do it better. And and we'll we'll try. <laughs> we'll try. All right. So uh, uh, one thing I forgot. We need to talk about what our next show is going to be. Yeah. So we've got uh, Hunter Coffee and Walter Zausch from Three Boys Distillery over in Frankfort, Kentucky. Coming on. They have got a tremendous amount of experimentation going on. Uh, I believe Alan might be joining us on that as well. So we'll get a little bit more of that distiller on distiller action that was referenced earlier, but I'm sure it's going to be a great show. Yeah, absolutely. Distiller scissoring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, <laughs> on behalf of Drew, our guest host, Alan, and our wonderful guest, Adam Stump, cheers, love, cheers. Cheers. free bird. I already drank all my delicious rye whiskey. It's gone. <laughs> well, go you'll have to go begging for more. I got about a third of a bottle to get through yet tonight. <laughs> all right. So like come good night, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everybody. Later, guys. Good night.